Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, I guess you notice Miss Lily is not here. She is off at a spa in North Carolina getting her nails done and we hope that she'll be back next week. Don't worry, all is well. She just needed a break. Don't we all? Anyway, uh, in the news, some really interesting stuff going on, uh, particularly in Peru. Uh, there was a recording of 3,487 sea lions that uh, died, and they think it's due to influenza A outbreak, five, the H5N1 variant. Uh, it's been, it was detected in, in uh, Peruvian pelicans on the north coast, but it spread all over Peru, and I have, I have been to... Uh, Peru, and I've, I've been to the uh, great islands out there, and uh, it's killing off a lot of the Peruvian boobies, one of my favorite animals, the blue-footed uh, booby. Also, sanderlings and uh, some of the cormorants. So it's a real problem, and we've got, this is the kind of surveillance we need to be looking at. It's very important that we sort of figure out what the mechanism is and make sure it doesn't get uh, transmitted to humans. But at last count, they had lost over 63,000 birds, uh, which is a big, big chunk. <laughs> I feel for those of you going to the Galapagos, it's maybe not the best time to go. Anyway, in addition, the FDA approved uh, uh, GSK's R uh, RSV, the, the respiratory syncytial virus vaccine, adding it to the one that was approved by Pfizer. So uh, if you're older, uh, it, it showed a great efficacy, 94% reduction in severe RSV disease. So that was really great uh, in the clinical trial. So. Good news on, on the RSV front. Now, let's turn our attention to COVID. This is from the WHO. Uh, blue is over 6,000 cases. So you can see this is more of a population map. Russia, China, the US, North America, Peru, all very uh, have the most cases. But if you look at it per 100,000, so it factors in the population size, the hot spot really is Austria and New Zealand for some reason, that's sort of crept up. The United States is looking good. This is in you know, hot spots in the U.S. last seven uh, days or so, very little activity. So, but if we think back on, on what's happened all this time, uh, the mortality rate per capita, this is the map. So we lost a lot of people, uh, particularly in the Southeast and the Midwest. Uh, and as we've, if you look at the past year of COVID, 90% of the deaths have now occurred in people who are 65 or older. Uh, it's, and that's what happens with respiratory diseases. Uh, over time, it becomes a, a disease that re really afflicts the uh, elderly more than anyone else. Harris County, amazingly enough, we did very well uh, relative to the rest of, co of the country with only 11,642 deaths, 247 per 100,000. That's, I know it's tragic, but I think part of the reason we did well as a county is because we got together and spent a lot of time planning and uh, treating uh, appropriately the patients that we saw. Uh, if you look at the trend lines, uh, morbidity overall is beginning to plateau. It's still pretty significant. Case rates are going down, as you can see, and hospitalization rates for those are going, for particularly over the age of 70, are going down, which is good news. And probably the best news of all, I've been, mentioned this in the last few weeks, there has not been another variant that's emerged, and that's probably the best news of all, if it stays the XBB1.5 uh, variant, eventually you know, people will either be resistant because they've been vaccinated with the bivalent booster or they've gotten the disease, that will eventually get, lead to broad, broad immunity. If you think back to the, the flu pandemic in 1918, uh, it took two, two and a half years for it to really go through and finally be done. COVID pandemic has been about that, two and a half to three years, but it's not, unfortunately, it's still around, still circulating. And if you look at wastewater across the country, 34% of the sites are still reporting increases in COVID. So it's going to, as I've mentioned the last few weeks, it looks like it's just going to be bouncing around with various uh, increases in, in uh, infectivity in various communities. Uh, you probably find the, the communities that either haven't been vaccinated or still uh, still uh, susceptible to the disease. Uh, Texas is looking pretty good. So this is the CDC map. Green means it's low, uh, low rates of, of transmission. Dimmick County and Harris County both uh, were in the zero uh, case number last week. Uh, and this is the city of Houston's wastewater data. It continues to drop, which is all very good. Now I wanted to uh, turn our attention to long COVID. It's been interesting, if you look back at the incidence of long COVID with infection, 
it started off with a very high incidence, almost 46% of the patients who originally got the, the original strain identified in Wuhan, or even the first variants all the way to uh, the alpha strain, had a very high incidence of long COVID. Uh, it dropped about 35% incidence with Delta, and it's down to 14% with Omicron. But there was a really interesting study uh, that was in The Lancet that looked at a randomized trial with three different interventions, uh, it, and it was placebo-controlled. So placebo or metformin, uh, a, a drug that's used to uh, uh, treat diabetics, uh, ivermectin, our famous ivermectin, which is an antiparasitic drug, and fluvoxamine, which is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SSRI, which is treated for OCD and depression. All of these have been, at one time, considered treatments uh, for, uh, for, long, for COVID. So one of the things I want to do is I, I, feel, bad for, I feel bad for the ivermectin, because they got a, a really, really bad name, because people were saying it would be great for COVID, and there was absolutely no data to support that. But, but ivermectin, you know, is an antiparasitic drug that is very effective for treating head lice, scabies, river blindness, strongyloides, uh, ascariasis, and lymphatic filariasis. And people forget that William Campbell and Satoshi Amura won the, the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2015 for the discovery of ivermectin. So they finally had a, a drug that uh, uh, could be used to treat parasitic disease. And then <laughs> some crazy people, or not crazy people, some people tried it in COVID and it didn't work. And so uh, everybody now treats ivermectin like it's, it's like a, a culture war drug. But in fact, it's a really important drug for the treatment of parasites. So that was the, the, the concept. Now, this, the reason they were looking is there seemed to be an increase in, in long COVID and obese patients. So this was 1,100 patients, very well done study, ages 30 to 85 who generally were overweight. So you had to have uh, a BMI of 30 or more. So these were overweight people. Uh, they had to have symptoms sooner than, like less than, fewer than seven days. So it was during the acute, uh, acute uh, COVID infection. Uh, they had to be enrolled within three days of presentation and they, have to, they had to have a documented SARS-CoV-2 infection by PCR. So this was a really good study. And then they were randomized to placebo, uh, ivermectin, uh, metformin, or fluvoxamine. And what it showed was that Overall, the incidence was about 8.4% with long COVID, so that's consistent with the data we have for, uh, for Omicron. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, the uh, incidence for metformin was 6.3%, and it, for the placebo control group, it was 10.6%. So while the overall group was 8%, it was a significant reduction. Uh, so metformin was really very effective, 42% decrease or 4.3 absolute decrease in long COVID using the, the um, using metformin. Now, why why that works? I don't know, but let's, this was the placebo group versus metformin. So you could see a real uh, divergence, a real benefit from metformin treat, treatment. Now, metformin is a drug that uh, is used to treat type two high uh, diabetes. It decreases hepatic glucose production, uh, decreases the absorption of glucose, and also improves insulin, insulin sensitivity by increasing uh, peripheral glucose utilization in, in muscle. It's, it's commonly used for type 2 diabetics, so I don't know if it's the benefit is because those people who are obese had a metabolic syndrome that pre, sort of predisposed them to having problems with, with uh, COVID or whether or not it was from the direct effect. But it, it was significant and placebo controlled, a double-blind study. So very important study that I think is useful when you start thinking about uh, patients who are obese who, who show up with COVID. Um, Another really uh, interesting review, uh, Dr. Topol, who uh, we had was a previous visitor here, and we gave him an honorary degree, graduation speaker, and is at uh, Scripps, looked at six studies on cardiovascular outcomes. One of the interesting things is that there seems to be an increase in, 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 in cardiovascular disease uh, after COVID. And so it, uh, he looked at six studies that looked at very large numbers of patients, uh, and four of the studies really didn't show much of a, 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 of a difference, but two of the studies showed that there was a significant two to full five increase in cardiovascular, uh, in cardiovascular risk in people who did get COVID. Uh, and they also showed, the, these studies showed that uh, vaccination confers some protection. So vaccination reduced the uh, risk of cardiovascular disease by twofold. It didn't go to zero with vaccination, but it was a signif significantly better uh, in the vaccinated patients versus those who were unvaccinated. 
Mechanism of action isn't all that clear. We know that the ACE2 receptor is on many blood vessels, so the thought is that it causes uh, blood vessel inflammation, leaking of fluid, and also some uh, potentiation of uh, platelet aggregation and thrombotic events. So the, combine those, there was a number increase in strokes and in, in cardiovascular risk, uh, heart attacks, et cetera. So we have two interesting studies that came out this week looking at the complications of COVID. Okay, I want to end today with a couple of shout outs. First, this past, uh, this week, we have opened up uh, the Oak Lynn Medical Tower, a uh, beautiful new facility for our outpatient uh, uh, practice in, in uh, ambulatory surgery. It also houses the Dan L. Duncan Cancer Center, uh, our comprehensive cancer center, uh, uh, which now will have about five times the amount of space, including uh, an 80 bay infusion unit uh, and a, a, um, uh, a phase one study unit. Also, I want to congratulate Dr. Gen Jennifer Blumenthal-Barbie, the Associate Director for the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy, who was elected uh, as a Hastings Center Fellow. This is a group of individuals uh, whose work has informed scholarship and public understanding of complex ethical issues in healthcare. So congratulations to uh, Dr. Uh, Blumenthal-Barbie. And then finally, as you know, this weekend, we host the Final Four. Uh, and based on the participants in the Final Four and, the, and that it's being held in Houston with none of the teams from Texas, uh, we, we are expecting, hold your hat, literally tens of people to show up for this event. And I know this is mind blowing, but you can get tickets for this if you're willing to spend as much as $15. I know, it's going to be a disaster. No one's going to go. But, you know, I can't even name the, the four schools, in it, but congratulations to the four schools who made it. I don't care about any of them. Have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week.